Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome to today's webinar. We've got a great group this morning. Uh, today's topic is supporting socially isolated older adults. And so thank you again for being with us today. Our complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration of sponsorship with O'Connor Mortuary. Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, and of course us here at Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klabe. I'm the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's Orange County. I'll be your host today. Our sponsors provide these webinars to you as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for or works with older adults, and we do hope you find today's presentation informative and useful. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker for today and he may even pop up on the screen here. Michael Splain is the owner and principal in Splain Consulting, a small advocacy and government affairs consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. Immediately prior to starting this company, Mike was director of state government affairs in the public policy division of the U.S. Alzheimer's Association, leading its grassroots network to accomplish state policy priorities, including comprehensive state Alzheimer plans. Among his clients, Mike's a consultant to the Alzheimer's Association and CDC Healthy Brain Initiative, and recently was the lead on behalf of the association on its Roadmap for Indian Country document and related outreach. He has also been policy advisor for Alzheimer's Disease International, active with ADI's World Health Organization Strategy Group, and advancing policy agenda with UN-based opportunities in New York and Geneva. He's the managing partner of a related company, Recruitment Partners LLC, focused on improving the pace, quality, and diversity of recruitment into dementia clinical trials. He makes his home in Columbia, Maryland with his amazing wife, Sandy, enjoying occasional inspirational visits from his three daughters and two grandchildren. And we are so pleased to have him today. And Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. This should work. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, it's an interesting topic in these times of COVID to talk about supporting socially isolated older adults. With or without COVID, it's still a very interesting topic. Um, I want to just uh, quickly disclose that we have a number of clients, among them Alzheimer's Orange County. Um, but as uh, you can see here, none of my clients have any control over this presentation, except Melissa when she asks those poll questions. Um, where we're going to go this afternoon, I, I want to start with a little bit of definition of terms so that we maybe all get uh, on the same page. Uh, then I will review causes of social isolation and loneliness and what we know from the data about the health impacts of both. I'm a very solutions oriented guy, so I will be talking about promising practices in supporting persons that are social, older persons that are socially isolated, and we'll take some time to talk about special actions for persons with dementia who are living alone. Our background includes, uh, over the last two years, really concentrating on actions around supporting older adults with dementia of some sort who live alone, as you'll hear. So, you know, what do we know about social, uh, social isolation and loneliness? The literature, uh, the famous capital L literature, intertwines these two terms as if they are the same thing, and yet we find that they're not. When we did one of our uh, one day meetings on supporting people living alone with Alzheimer's in St. Louis, we let off the, the day with a speech by a woman who was living alone with Alzheimer's disease. And she said, you know, there's living alone with Alzheimer's disease and living alone, and they're different. And of course, all of us were a little bit taken aback for a minute. But then she went on to say that though I may live in a single person household, I don't really consider myself somebody who's living alone. There is a difference between social isolation, the isolation possibly of being um, in a household of one, and loneliness. Uh, and I think increasingly the literature is trying to divide these out. 
the the roots of the the literature in these terms are a husband wife team out of Chicago, uh, who are really credited with uh, not only doing base work in social isolation and loneliness in older adults, uh, but also really developing a whole new field of social neuroscience. Uh, John and Stephanie Cacioppo uh, were social scientists who dove into this feet first, uh, starting with John's book in the early 1990s, Human Nature and the Need for Social Interaction. Human Nature and the Need for Social Action, laying out the case for the social dimensions of humans' lives and how important they are to health, welfare, and overall well-being. So social isolation uh, may mean that somebody for reasons of how or where they live um, or who they are or other circumstances uh, find themselves isolated from other human beings. It doesn't necessarily lead from people being isolated that they are lonely, which John would say is the emotional reaction to the condition of being socially isolated. So that loneliness and social isolation, but as you'll hear, we start talking about some of what we know about the empirical study of these, uh, that the terms are mixed up together at times. So let's talk about what are some of the causes. I'm sure you know some of these, but let me just point out that as a baby boomer, uh, in the first wave of baby boomers, I, I'm part of a, a wave that we all well know, a wave of population that has changed everything that we have been a part of since we literally since we were born. I bet other baby boomers on the phone might remember something called double sessions when we used to go to school for only half a day and a second shift came in of the same grade with the same teacher because we literally were blowing up the capacity of the schools such that we had to run two shifts of second grade. I don't know what I missed, but I'm sure I missed something in second grade. Maybe it was spelling, but we're very familiar with talking about those was the work in aging, very familiar talking about the demographic, uh, the demographic bulge, the baby boomer changes that we're experiencing. Uh, not, uh, this unre not unrelated is uh, a real shift in demographics in our country toward single person households. This sometimes isolation is caused by housing choices and styles that are available or that people choose. Um, I know if you live in um, a very urban area like San Francisco, uh, we're seeing microscopic size single person dwellings becoming a housing choice. Although with COVID, I hear they're also coming on the market. I think our culture will talk about that a little bit, but I think people with health problems or disability in older age find themselves isolated from the mainstream by virtue of those health challenges. Certainly people who live with dementia, which is our deepest experience as a, uh, as a consultant and as a, in my workplace, um, but other disabilities can be cause social isolation. We live in a car culture. And although many of us are benefiting from being locked down because of COVID, I can't tell you, I think, I think I bought my last tank of gas two months ago. Uh, so we're all learning about uh, the changes in our lifestyle when we don't drive so much. But as older, as older persons become less able or less positive about their skills and driving and transportation and mobility options are scarce, uh, that is a cause of social isolation. Um, sometimes social isolation is a, is a consequence of choices made. Uh, we have a, a generation, for example, that is not uh, getting married in the conventional way, um, that our society has become much more accepting of persons who choose to live alone or live without a life partner. Um, I think that's uh, a cause of social isolation downstream. 
Substance and alcohol abuse are isolating for not just for elders, but for anyone who has those problems. And I was delighted to see that uh, there are a number of behavioral health, mental health professionals that have joined us this afternoon. I think there is an expectation there is a, in terms of how we construct our housing, how we construct our families. I think America is, has moved away from multi-generational families within a gener generation. Uh, we've concentrated on a lifestyle of nuclear families. We've concentrated on launching our kids. And I think there's some inherent cultural expectations and bias that have led to increased social isolation of elders. Couple that with ageism and you begin to understand that there are just cultural roots that are embedded in uh, in our culture that are very, very hard to change. One ex example of that is in the community we live in, we live in a place called Howard County in Maryland. And over the last 20 years, we've seen the only multifamily housing that has been built are so-called active aging 55 and older communities of which there've been over 20 built in our little county of a million people over the last 20 years. What do you call a 55 and older community 20 years later? 75 and older. And we've created these islands of car dependent, um, socially isolated groups of older adults, many of whom are living in social isolation. And of course, it goes without saying that COVID-19 and related lockdown and health security issues have made this even more daunting. So those are some of the causes. I just want to take a trip down demography lane for a minute. I want you to meet my Aunt Betty. Aunt Betty was born in 1920. She was one of 1.6 million girl babies born in 1920. There was a little baby boomlet because we were just coming out of the 1918 epidemic, uh, flu epidemic. Uh, and Aunt Betty had the privilege and the joy of serving in the United States Coast Guard. There she is in 1945. She was a spar. That's what the women in the Coast Guard were called. And in 1945, she was one of 10,000 women serving our country in the Coast Guard. One of over a million women who served in the armed services during World War II. And as Aunt Betty schooled me, my dad's sister schooled me well, and they sent us all home in the middle of 1945 without a GI Bill or even getting our forwarding address. Well, fast forward, dem Demography Lane, a little later in her life, there's Aunt Betty in the uniform that, in which she retired. She retired as a Chief Warrant Officer four, and had a remarkable first woman, a lot of things in the Coast Guard for many years. But by 2001, she was one of 500 of those original 10,000. There's a funneling effect. And I think this de the demographics are in part driving the social isolation. So the demographic cake is baked. And when we look at the next slide with some statistics, you'll see even more so how the demographic cake is baked in that we can see that in, in and around Orange County, a full third of householders living alone are persons over the age of 65. This is amazing data from the 20, and again, this is old data. Let me just put a big asterisk on this and say, this is from Census Bureau estimates in 2017, which were based on projections from the 2010 census. My hunch is that these numbers in red that you see here in terms of those percentages are going to be massively increased when we're done with the 1920, I'm sorry, with the 2020 counts. Got mixed up there with Aunt Betty. If we want to just take a moment and talk about loneliness because social isolation is not necessarily loneliness. We've talked about that. Victor and Bowling, I think, did a, a wonderful typology of causes of loneliness in Great Britain that I think has much application here in the United States. And 
causes of loneliness among them uh, include besides living alone is that people experience the death of a spouse or a life partner um, and you can only imagine and maybe you've li you're living this you can only imagine what that might be like to have a life partner for 30 or 40 or 50 years and then to lose them and then end up living alone. Victor and Bowling also talk about the fact that as people age, they may have fewer confiding relationships. They may have fewer cronies to talk to about that are of their own generation and may not have developed uh, similar relationships with younger people. I certainly recognize my mom just turned 89 and I just realized that uh, she is the last of her generation of uh, her both her birth family as well as all of her first cousins and she's one of the last five of her buddies that she's played bridge with for the last 40 years. She has fewer confiding relationships and she's experiencing the dying off of social networks uh, that creates a certain amount of loneliness in older people. Underappreciated uh, are the death of pets. And although we have from time to time uh, been a pet parent family, um, I really, um, uh, this is not one I understand personally, but I can appreciate as I see the mourning that literally people go through uh, when they lose a pet of long standing in their home. Mandatory retirement cuts us off and may create loneliness because we've cut off from a meaningful community of work, possibly when we still think we had something to offer. And this creates the reaction of loneliness. Persons with dementia or even those that are, that are ex experiencing their own subjective cognitive impairment uh, may have great difficulty and become more lonely and isolated because they have great difficulty in interacting socially. And you can't forget that persons with either sight or hearing impairment uh, can feel cut off and not part of the mainstream, either in conversations or even interactions like going to the grocery store or going to church that we might experience. So there are a number of causes of both social isolation and loneliness uh, to consider when we think about supporting people who are socially isolated. So as social isolation and has come to the fore, uh, probably starting as, uh, as early as three or four years ago, I think we've all heard this. We're going to talk now a little bit about the health impacts of social isolation. And I think knowing a little bit about the health impacts gives us something to stand on when we think about persuading health providers, the people we work with, the networks who are part of, to take action about social isolation. Well, we've all heard this. I think so. it started with some surge in general or somebody putting some stats together that suggested that social isolation is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This is uh, frequently seen in uh, advocacy groups like AERPs writing about this. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a decent basis in, in calculation, uh, but I will tell you that nothing is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, said the public health guy. But we've heard this, and what do we mean when we say that? Well, there are a number of, and I, um, an AERP has done a brilliant job, you see the references there, of really trying to document what are the health impacts of loneliness for elders living in the United States? And first and foremost, those elders experience more depression. And depression is a whole of body and spirit and mind experience. It's not just all in your head. That clinical depression or borderline clinical depression actually has a real impact on how our body works, how healthy we are, how we are able to fend off other disease and so on. So a major impact, health impact of loneliness is in fact depression. AERP's report also documents that there's a greater use of skilled nursing facility 
among people that are socially isolated and uh, and or lonely. This cuts both ways in that it is in fact true if you look at the numbers that nursing homes and assisted living, related assisted living, excuse me, I'll speak California, RCFEs, are in fact disproportionately serving persons who previously lived in a single person household. So I think it, it cuts both ways in that what is a supportive living environment for somebody with some degree of disability or some degree of wanting to live a more social life, uh, they may very well choose some kind of a care community. On the other hand, it may also be the only default, it may be the default position of persons like discharge planners confronting a socially isolated older adult uh, in a, dis a hospital discharge situation, only being able to imagine that it's a one-way ticket to a skilled nursing facility rehab bed. We know that people who are lonely and have cardiovascular disease have higher death rates. They have la larger numbers of emergency visits, emergency visits and emergency hospitalizations, and they seem to have real difficulty in hearing to medical treatment. I think about this a lot, and I, I, have a, I have a crazy life partner named Sandy. We've only been together for a mere 43 years, so we're just, we're just getting started. Um, but I, I thought about this adherence issue in personal terms in that uh, it's really great to have support when you're starting a new medical treatment or where you're actually trying to get medical treatment. Uh, it's really great to have that built-in support of a spouse to do that. There's some new studies that are pointing out that although I'm not a member of the Church of Amyloid, it is a big hypothesis in the Alzheimer world. And there are some studies that suggest based on imaging that persons who are lonely or people who are socially isolated have more amyloid building up in their brain. And in fact, then uh, there may be an actual physical reason why they experience more cognitive impairment from diseases like Alzheimer's disease. People who are socially isolated and lonely have a weakened immune response. And in fact, this may in fact account for some of the higher death rates and some of the, as well as some of the adherence issues, the larger numbers of use of emergency rooms and hospitalizations. If people smoke, um, there is a whole branch of study going on right now about how and why socially isolated people who smoke are not only health impacted from the smoking, um, but there is now a couple of studies that are really looking at the demographics of uh, single person household fires because it's believed that um, this is a bad combination. Both smoking and living alone is a bad combination. And last, uh, persons in this situation of being socially isolated get less and participate less in exercise. So I want to expose the group to some promising practices and in supporting socially isolated older adults. I think it's important as I do that to ask the question, what are we solving for? What's the level of evidence that we have about what works? And what's the time horizon on which we can do something? Because people, although people may become socially isolated quite suddenly from a death of a pet or a death of a partner or because of a a change in, in lifestyle of some sort. It's really important to, as we look at what are some of the promising practices in supporting people, uh, we think about what is the time horizon that we have in which to make a difference in their overall social isolation or loneliness. Gardner et al. put a wonderful uh, Cochrane Review style article together that reviewed uh, to the point of mid-2018 uh, all the interventions that they could find that were intended to reduce social isolation and loneliness among older people. 
and those that they found that had the highest level of evidence of impacting people's isolation and their related health conditions were social facilitation interventions. That's the category they created. That among them, they find in their review that senior centers, adult day health, uh, friendship clubs, which are very common in the United Kingdom. Here, they might be dementia cafes or senior centers might be the equivalent. And video conferencing, interestingly, even in 2018 with distant family, those social facilitation interventions had a major impact on feelings of loneliness and social isolation. And probably the facts, not just the feelings of social isolation and loneliness. They also document a number of psychological therapies that in RCTs, randomized control clinical trials, a very high level of evidence, a number of psychological therapies that are shown to have an impact on social isolation and lo loneliness. Among them, humor therapy, mindfulness training and mindfulness groups, and reminiscence groups, all forms of individual or group therapy that were shown to have an impact that reduce social isolation and loneliness among older people. I commend this article to anybody that is uh, looking at this, or for those of you that are in the business of either on the therapy side or in things like senior centers and day health, um, I would commend this article to you to give you a very high level of confidence and evidence that you are able to impact social isolation and loneliness among older people. Um, another promising practice that I would encourage you to consider from the campaign to end loneliness.org, um, they do a pretty darn good job of documenting simple, easy to use in the public domain loneliness measurements that can be added to your intake or to your practice. Actually, you could screen with any of these three scales, you could screen for loneliness as you are encountering people or bringing people into a service. The campaign to end loneliness as its own validated measurement tool. They also point out that Dijon Gervold have a six item scale that has lots of literature behind it. And Lowe, a Californian, the UCLA three item loneliness scale. So consider in terms of a promising practice, asking screening questions about loneliness with an idea that this health impact and cumulative social impact is something that you want to do with and for that person who is experiencing loneliness and social isolation. Another cool tool from California, actually from Orange County, California, the home of a company called Atlas of Caregiving. Actually, it's a nonprofit, atlasofcaregiving.com run by a gentleman named Raj Mehta. Raj has developed a number of uh, tools around care mapping that are really simple, easy to use tools to help persons realize or uncover the relationships in their life in both directions, them giving care and them receiving care that might have an impact on their social isolation and loneliness. It's easy to use, all their tools are in the public domain, uh, and he's local to some of you that are listening in California. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at the idea that a care map created by an individual uh, might in fact give them some insights into their current condition, but also give them some way of being planful about a future condition. Raj uh, spoke, has spoken at all of our Living Alone with Alzheimer's Solution Summits that our company has done so far. And the most profound time he spoke, we had a lady with Alzheimer's named Mary uh, who had been 
one of these people living with dementia who was super committed to living her best life with dementia. She had actually been doing advocacy at the United Nations on Alzheimer's and aging as disability rights issues. She was a retired, unfortunately against her will, scientist. Uh, she had a wonderful network of friends and a funny looking little dog that I can't even begin to tell you what breed it was. And she did it when she did her care map. The interesting insight that she had is she said, This is my situation today, and I feel like I've set myself up with a number of things to support me living alone with dementia and living my best life living alone with dementia. But what I didn't think about is what happens next. And I, I wonder whether or not that might, those of us that are working with people with Alzheimer's disease might think about a more gentle way of helping people think about what might be coming up in their future. Another tool that we've seen or another approach that we've seen to support socially isolated low, older adults are those that are in crises. Uh, this is only part of the story, even though it may be the picture that comes to mind when we say socially isolated older adult, socially isolated person living alone with dementia. Um, we, we, what may immediately come to mind is uh, a hoarder's house. That's what happens when we ask when we ask people point blank, what do they think of when they think of, of people like this? That's what comes to mind. Too bad that television show is imprinted in our brain. Well, okay, not enough about that. What is a complex social work case table? What communities find is that there are a number of people that are going from literally, that are living alone, that are going from agency to agency for support. And it's almost, and they're well known agency by agency, but there's a lack of coordination and pooling of resources or even a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with people. One community that's worked on this quite extensively that we've worked in is Las Vegas, where they said it's almost as if it's Catholic Charities' turn, then it's Nevada Senior Services' turn, then the emergency medical technicians go back to the firehouse and they raise $500 to pay for the electric bill. There's just this cycling of people, a small number of people through a number of different agencies. So complex social work case tables basically are a way in which a lead agency might be public health, uh, particularly in communities where public health hospitals are the payers and the support of last result or resort, last resort, uh, where a lead agency will convene people from across the elder care and social care resources and convenes them as needed to work across disciplines and across agencies to focus on this population. Some of these, uh, Denver Health, the article cited below, focused on high emergency room and hospital users, thinking that in fact the problems and the underlying problems of these people who continued to cycle through their hospital and their hospital emergency rooms probably had more social isolation problems than they had actual health issues. But this all comes down to understanding and in our current climate where we're all talking about social determinants of health, our home, our home life, our home structure, whether we live alone, live with others, live in a multi-generational, multicultural family or whatever, is in fact becoming more recognized and appreciated as a social determinant of health. So another community level support or another community level way to support socially isolated older adults that are in crisis could be to com build a complex social work case table to deal with crises. With COVID, we're seeing some what all things become old things becoming new, but we've seen a number of ideas from past being recycled. Um, we see some communities and some individuals starting phone trees as a way of checking in or having people that are isolated check in with each other on a structured basis. You know how this works. 
You remember a phone with a dial? Well, if you remember a phone with a dial, you may remember that we used to set up phone trees to actually activate advocacy networks or to pass information where in a structured way, one person calls two, those two people call two more each, and so on and so forth so until you get uh, you know, 100, 200 people contacted with a simple message, phone trees. Um, we know of communities that are reducing social isolation by scheduling regular dial-in conference calls where people, because they can't get out because of their isolation, uh, are meeting at a, a regularly scheduled time. Uh, there are lots of jokes about Zoom wine, quarantinis, uh, yeah, okay, you get the drift. But in fact, uh, conference calls uh, can be super, aff super affordable, easy to initiate. There's been a lot of news coverage of pen pals. Uh, yes, writing notes to one another, actually using the United States mail uh, and finding and, and connecting socially isolated people. This has particularly been used by care communities that have had to shut down visitation in a traditional visitation for uh, people because of reasons of COVID. Uh, but in fact, uh, but putting anybody together who's socially isolated with a regular uh, written communication might be a recycled idea that's worth considering. Of course, if it's in cursive handwriting, I have discovered my uh, granddaughter, who is a high school freshman, does not know how to do cursive. It's never been taught. So I just consider cursive writing and as a pen pal, my secret code in my old age. There is a national-ish organ organization called Dementia Buddies um, that is also focused on providing uh, friends and friendly support in a number of different ways to socially isolated people that are living or identify themselves as living with dementia. Home sharing, oh my goodness. Uh, there is a small underground movement in the United States with lots of uh, enthusiastic supporters. You can see the enthusiastic supporters here in which previously unrelated people put their resources together in their older age in order to um, have a better life, have a less socially isolated life. The classic about this appeared in Money Magazine about five years ago when they told the story of four retired teachers in Massachusetts who were moping about being stuck in the snow. By the way, that little flower that Melissa told you, no, that's a snowflake to those of us that come from those kind of climates. At any rate, these four teachers were bemoaning the fact that they wished they could go to Florida. Uh, and they realized that between them, they each had a fully appreciated paid up home one of which was one that had six bedrooms. And the brainstorming came and you know what happened. They sold three houses, they bought one in Florida, they kept the house with six bedrooms and they basically created a home sharing community and the rest is history. Um, so home sharing cooperatives, these are creating intentional community, they're private arrangements between private individuals and they're definitely time limited for people with dementia. But in fact, we see people with dementia seeking and or starting these kind of home sharing arrangements. The link there is the sharinghousing.com. They're a nonprofit out of Vermont with all kinds of practical information about how to uh, home share and find a roommate. So just a word about some Alzheimer's specific supports. And let me just preface this by saying uh, our finding uh, of really focusing on this area in the last two years, our finding is that it's very risky and it's felt to be risky to reveal that you live alone with Alzheimer's disease. This is confirms findings by the UCSF researcher Elana Portacolon, 
uh, who's written about the precarity of older adults living alone with cognitive impairment extensively and just got a major new five-year grant to continue to study empirically who these people are. But it's risky because it contradicts the dominant loved one, dominant dyadic story about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are a number of uh, assumptions and stigma about what it means to be dealing with Alzheimer's disease and people report that are in this condition po point out that they feel shunned by others who are temporarily ably brained. Um, it certainly can be a limiting factor in your mobility in a state like California uh, with the strictest rules in the nation about the reporting of an Alzheimer diagnosis to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, Car-driven car society is a challenge to your mobility and that there are few, if any, services that are specifically geared to people who live alone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've seen a number of uh, experiments in dementia-specific shared housing. Uh, these have been largely in Germany, where people that are quasi-independently quasi living have a home in which they share meals and social events and a real serious focus on nutrition, which is another health aspect uh, that falls off when people live alone and feel socially isolated or lonely. Um, this works, th this model works in Germany because it's backed by a locally funded dementia care network ecosystem. I'm not sure it would work in the United States quite the same way where we have serious fragmentation and disconnection between the different elements of a dementia care ecosystem. But these dementia-specific shared housing models uh, have had serious quality of life uh, measures, results, outcomes, and you can see the reference there. Um, we also see the beginning of, we're involved in developing and supporting an online community of by and for people living alone with dementia. It's designed to provide emotional support, curated information, and of course it's for and by the persons living with dementia. It's limited in that it is a Facebook group, which means people need to be able to have and use online community tools. Question time already? It is. All right. Well, we've got one here. Um, somebody asked uh, how Meals on Wheels programs can be used as a source of regular contact for older adults and what you think about that. Well, I think they are being used in that way. Um, I think we, I mean, everybody, I mean, uh, we, we pay attention to NANIS. Uh, the National the National Association of Senior Meal Providers, and I think there's been a massive conversion at the local level of congregate delivered meals to more home delivered meals. Um, I, I think it uh, I think it is a lifeline for a number of people. Both it may be the only social interaction that some people get. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it studied empirically. Gotcha. But I'll look. Okay, great. Um, and I want to remind everyone that um, we have ample time for questions right now, but if we do have questions that we don't get to, Mike uh, has made his contact information available to you, and we'll make sure and share that with you um, so that we you can get all your good questions answered. Um, here's another one. Someone says, I work in a skilled nursing facility, and we have rooms that are currently on yellow slash quarantined zone. We're doing FaceTime, but what else can we do to help them reduce loneliness? This is a brutal question for all of us. I think um, I think FaceTime is part of it. I think uh, we've seen an easing up of some of the uh, uh, some of the visitation rules. Uh, I think um, music. Uh, we're hearing a lot about people in care communities making more music available to people uh, with um, individualized music with headphones. There are a couple of very prominent programs that, uh, that, that do that specifically in nursing homes. 
Uh, and if people are interested in that, I'm glad to send Melissa the reference or send it to anybody that emails me. Uh, I think the the other uh, aspect of this is that nursing homes and care communities in general, and including adult day health and assisted living, are have been at the absolute butt end of the personal protective equipment pipeline. And I think it's it's been documented and I think it's imperative as advocates that that become known and that that cease. I think there's a real advocacy, ageism, um, treatment of, of people that are in care as throwaway people. Uh, the biggest shipment that FEMA made to skilled nursing facilities of protective equipment sent child size masks to nursing homes. There's just yeah. something culturally ageist and wrong about that picture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here, thoughts on low income housing and how to support those seniors who have no access to technology? So, uh, we actually have, uh, I, I have one of my crack researchers developing a, a, a guide to free and no cost internet. Uh, and so if somebody wants, to, whoever that was, wants to send me an email, that'll be ready in about another week because we realize in another project that this whole, act, that there is a real digital access issue, particularly for people that live in senior housing. So there are ways to get free, not only hardware, but also free internet service for low income individuals. And we're trying to put that into a nice little handout right now for another project. Glad to share it. I think uh, I think you hit a very important point that, the, you know, that this, we can't assume everybody knows or has what they need, has access to digital, but also knows how to use it, which is the other aspect of this, which is, uh, being able to somehow in, a, in some way uh, match people that are in that situation with uh, those that can tutor them in its use. Really important, really important point you make. Absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts about friendly visitor programs um, to reduce social isolation during COVID times? Um, if you live in Southern California, you can sit in the backyard right. six feet apart. If you live where I live, you can sit out in the snow six feet apart come uh, a month from now. So I think I think they're helpful. I mean, they're they're you know, they've been, you know, friendly visitor programs have been around for 30 years. I mean, they, they're quaint helpful little programs. I, I just think that whoever is going out visiting needs to be absolutely, um, you know, has to be absolutely COVID free and use all available recommendations of our public health authorities, including masks. Absolutely. Um, are there studies that you know of uh, being conducted on the dramatic effect that the increased amount of, of older adults that are being isolated during this pandemic? There are a lot of folks studying it. The National Institute of Aging is, has put out a very specific funding opportunity to try to, um, you know, try to empirically measure the, uh, the impact. Um, and you know, I, I, I nothing. Nobody's published yet. Uh, I think the place to watch, where you'll see a impact study first, if you are a member of or a fan of AARP, uh, my guess is you'll see a, 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 some kind of an empirical impact study from their public policy institute by early next year. Great. Um, we had a question about your contact information. Would you mind going to that slide real quick so people can take down your contact information as we're answering questions here? Sure. Well, yeah. So just a quick note of summary. Uh, a sure. great book, a uh, couple of things to think about. I, I'm a reader, so I, I make no apologies for that. <laughs> um, but there was a great classic uh, a number of years ago called Bowling Alone, which really talked about the uh, the state of community in America, uh, where in which the author talks about how 
uh, we're becoming a nation with less secondary and even tertiary community. And I think even with the internet, maybe we have quadrenary community. And the last classic that I'd call to your attention is that this is about meaning. And social relationships are about part of how we fulfill our overall search for meaning. Um, there's the contact information, uh, including a phone number. APPLAUD stands for Action Planning for Living Alone with Dementia, something we're doing at the community level as we can. Uh, we even did it via a big, huge Zoomer last week So, uh, for the state of Rhode Island. So uh, anything seems to be possible on technology. If you have somebody a third of your age to run it, it's even better. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right, let's see if we can squeeze in a few more questions here. Uh, one question, what criteria would you use to determine if someone living alone with dementia may no longer be safe to live alone? The first thing I'd do is I'd ask them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be my How first novel. criteria. <laughs> How novel. Ask the person <laughs> affected by the problem um, about their either loneliness, use one of those loneliness scales about their anxiety about living alone, uh, help have them uh, do an inventory of, um, you know, what are the assets that they've brought to bear to living alone. Um, I, I recognize that uh, we are now at a situation where as much as 70% of adult protective services uh, referrals are for the category of self-neglect. This makes me deeply suspicious uh, because I don't think a dirty house is necessarily a, a bad thing if somebody's been a horrible housekeeper their whole life. So the point I'm making there with a little exaggeration is um, that I think you, somebody with a social history, uh, somebody who's a decent social historian needs to give that, maybe give you some context about that person living alone. I guarantee you, Aunt Betty was not the world's greatest housekeeper, um, but she, you know, but she was perfectly capable of living alone until somebody saw her messy house, saw her advanced age and frailty, and said, "Oh, maybe we need to rescue Aunt Betty because she's not safe." Uh, this is just where this is just kind of our knee-jerk reaction, hopefully. Uh, that and and it's, it comes from a good place. It comes from concern about our fellow humans. It's a wonderful thing but any strength overused can become a weakness. So I think ask the person themselves. And then I think there are, uh, and I'll dig them up if you wanna send me a email, I'll dig them up, but there are some standardized safety um, uh, quick surveys that you can, you can use to add on to that. But it's probably mostly in the adult protective services realm, uh, which gets scary. Sure. Um, would you mind putting up the last slide real quick? Uh, we do maybe have time for one more question, but I do want to briefly thank our sponsors one last time. Um, we are so thankful to O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services and Caring Companions at Home. Um, our, our webinar next month will be on November 10th and it's going to be on the topic of depression and dementia in older adults. Um, by Allison Lyric. Um, so please do uh, sign up and join us for that. Um, thank you all again. And, and do make sure to watch out for the survey that will pop up again that you will need to fill out if you're looking for that continuing education credit. Um, let's do one more question here, uh, Mike. Due to COVID, as therapists, we aren't able to see clients in person. Do you believe teletherapy is as effective as in-person therapy? And how can we make teletherapy more effective for clients with dementia? Well, first, get a HIPAA compliant Zoom account for the love of God and protect <laughs> people's private information and don't and and be very conscious of patients rights or person's rights um, and not so quick on the record button. Uh, that's my editorial about that. I think there is evidence that teletherapy sessions can be as effective um, and that they're appreciated. Uh, and they're certainly appreciated more than not getting access at all. Um, I, I think therapy is a, a you know, therapy, um, it, particularly with the, the level of cameras and sophisticated audio we have, uh, probably can be as realistic as if you were in an office encounter. And I distinguish therapy 
from medical visits because I have a deep suspicion that a number of things that would be done by a nurse practitioner or a physician in the course of a medical visit are in fact not able to be accomplished over a te- uh, over a mm-hmm. computer connection, uh, which leads me to conclude that some telehealth is um, a little ambitious in terms of what you can really accomplish. But I, there is, I think, there's a fair amount of literature that suggests delivery of therapy via. Uh, telehealth systems is validated. Gotcha. Um, I do want to ask one more question because it's a question I have as well. But if anybody uh, is has been online for at least 60 minutes um, and you're looking for that CE credit, you are free to go. This will just take one minute here. Um, final question. Are you seeing major differences in the data with different cultural groups when it comes to older live alones? I think some cultural groups still uh, have multicultural fam- or multi-generational families as a dominant lifestyle. Um, I think, and I think that's that's fair to say that either for convenience or for tradition, uh, some groups um, still are living in multi-generational families. They haven't adopted the nuclear family model. That's one difference. I think other differences may very well be. Uh, how often people check in on each other. And of course, there's also some some gathering information about how uh, people who tradition, families who traditionally, even if they live apart, get together every weekend for a big meal or whatever, all of a sudden these darn things are turning into spreader events. So there's Mm -hmm. some contrary evidence starting to come out about uh, just how close do you want to be to your family uh, because people let their guard down, literally, they're letting their guard down and turning uh, joyous family occasions into COVID spreaders, which is a which is just terrible to think about. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I we had several questions that we didn't do, um, but we will forward those along to you. And, and anyone is free to also um, reach out to Mike or ask them in your survey. Um, thank you again, everyone, for being with us. We hope you stay well. Um, any final words, Mike? Well, I think uh, you ought to know that we're working with Alzheimer's Orange County. For those of you that might be curious, we're working on possibly initiating a transitions of care support program that we've uh, piloted in other markets called Hospital to Home. If you're interested in hospital care and people with dementia and post-hospital care for people who who, uh, are persons living with dementia, make a note in your survey. And as we start to build a stakeholders group, shameless plug, as we start to build a stakeholders Mm -hmm. group around the issue of care transitions in Orange County from hospital to home, Uh, We'd sure like to engender a little bit of participation from anybody in your community that's interested. Absolutely. Thank you for plugging that and do let us know in the survey. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day and we will see you all next month, hopefully. Take care.